Hi, I'm standing here in front of the Material Science Building here on the Engineering Quad at the University of Illinois campus. We're here today to talk to Professor Paul Braun. Paul is a professor of Material Science and Engineering here at the University of Illinois and is famous for being part of the team that 3D printed a battery. Now his battery doesn't look anything like this, but performs a similar function. We're going to talk to Paul about this battery, about 3D printing, and how this technology will change our lives forever. Please join me. Hello, Paul. Thanks for meeting with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Could you uh, tell us a bit about yourself? I've been at the University of Illinois since 1999 as a, on the faculty, although I actually was here from 93 to 98 as a graduate student, and before that was at Cornell. After finishing my PhD at Illinois, then I went to Bell Labs for a year. Uh, which is really when my work transformed from things that were, say, more fundamental chemistry uh, to thinking a lot more about the technological impact of materials. Um, and then obviously came back here a year after that, where I've been since I joined as an assistant professor. So my home department is uh, material science and engineering, and then I have a co-appointment in chemistry, and, and we do some work in the Beckman Institute and the MRL and a number of the other labs on campus. Everything is made of something. And so material science is what can you make things out of? How can you improve the properties of materials? It could be how do I make stronger glass for, say, a, a smartphone? How do I make faster computer chips, more efficient light bulbs, uh, better materials for doing drug deliveries? You can really think about material science as the applied aspects of chemistry and physics where maybe we don't care as much about the fundamentals, we still pay attention to them, but you know, how can we make these building blocks that, that impact the world? 3D printing, the way that we think about it, is very broad in how can I three-dimensionally structure materials in what we would call deterministic ways. And so some of our work on batteries, uh, we start by doing electroplating, and so we electroplate nickel. So a very simple metal, these are easy to electroplate. Uh, but we electroplate that using a very complicated polymer that, when we expose the light, generates some 3D superstructure. It's, it's akin to a lost wax process. But then some people will directly print much more complicated materials to start with. And so using print heads that can extrude out materials that can withstand very high temperatures or that might cause cells to grow in certain ways if you want to three-dimensionally print a scaffold for, for a human organ. We've been really excited by this idea of 3D printing of a battery. So we realized if you, if you zoom in on the inside of a battery, really what you have is you have three important things. You have something that can carry the electrons because batteries have to have electricity. You have something that can hold on to the energy storage material. So somehow a battery stores energy through chemistry. So that's in a material. And typically today it uses lithium ions. So I have to have some way to move these lithium ions around. And so what you need is you need a three-dimensional structure that can conduct electricity, hold on to the active energy storage material, and provide a really good way to move the ions between the plus and minus sides of the electrode. And so conventionally, when people make a battery, they do it by casting, um, and they get a random assortment of materials. And sometimes you have good networks, and sometimes you don't, and so the performance varies. But instead, if you could really build it much the way you think of a city, where you have super highways and local roads and places for the buildings, and so you define the architecture to give you really efficient ion transport, really efficient electron transport and put the energy storage stuff just where you want it, um, you can go into new performance metrics, uh, maybe really high power, better energy, fast charging. So we started doing this in large form batteries, and this is something we've taken really far, and now we have a startup company working on that. Uh, but then we said, wouldn't it be really, really interesting if you could make small batteries that you could print and maybe put them directly on a silicon, you know, on a computer chip? And so we had to think about new paradigms in materials because normal battery materials use high temperatures, corrosive processes that aren't compatible with computer chips. So what we realized is we needed a way to be able to 3D print 
the positive and negative terminals directly onto some substrate. We were able to do this using uh, optical patterning. So taking this light sensitive polymer, exposing it with light. When you expose it with multiple beams of light, the way that the light interacts creates a 3D pattern in the polymer. We then dissolve away the polymer that hasn't reacted with the light, and so that leaves behind what looks to be like a sponge. We take that sponge and then we do electroplating, the same way people used to put chrome on a bumper. We put it in solution and we fill all the pores with metal. So this is where the electrons can go. Then we remove the polymer, which was the, the, the house initially, and now we do a second electroplating process and a third electroplating process. One grows the positive side of the battery, one grows the minus side of the battery, and you end up then with fingers of positive and negative. If you look down on the battery, like this. And so now they're really close together, which means you can move the electrons fast. The, they have lots of pores, which helps you move the electrons, but they're all connected with metal. And so using that, we were able to make a battery which was only a few millimeters on a side. So you know something like a tenth of an inch on a side and about five times thinner than a human hair. And this battery could generate enough power to light up an LED and flash an LED. This is not going to replace, say, a laptop battery. What we think is that if we can move power down to the chip, now you could have a really small chip, maybe a little bigger than a grain of rice, and then that would have its own battery built right in with that chip, which means if you took that grain of rice-sized object and you, say, sprinkled it around, and each one had a little radio transmitter or a little blinking light on it, you could power those wherever they are without attaching any wires off to the outside world. You're not going to have a lot of power. This is, you know, batteries, power is proportional to volume. So if you want a lot of power, you get a big battery. You're not going to drive a car on a tiny little battery. But if you make a battery small and you still want a lot of power, you need this 3D structure so you can move ions and electrons quickly. And so that gives you the ability to pulse out and send information. So you could have this just sitting all around, and then once a day it would send just a little burst of information uh, that is only possible because that micro battery is sitting right by the computer chip. We'll, we'll take the applications really in two space. One is the idea of three-dimensionally structuring or 3D printing of, of the internal components of a battery. You know, we see that applying at sort of all length scales. So even for, say, a large car battery, if you can control the internal structure, that may give you the ability to charge the car in, say, five minutes. Because now you provide really fast ways that the ions can move and the electrons can move, and so you can put power into that. And then the other regime is when the batteries get very small. And here we can really push the performance metrics to the absolute because we then control every detail of the three-dimensional structure. And the applications in that space are things like uh, small pills that you might swallow that have enough power to be able to transmit a radio signal out or potentially deliver energy in the body to do some therapeutic. And you can make that a much smaller device because the battery can still give you a lot of power when it's small. Uh, there's the idea of basically the sensors everywhere. So instead of walking around a building and saying, uh, you know, I'll pick the five places I want a sensor, I make them so small that they're basically just the dust. And so you can sprinkle them where you'd like and they can transmit until the battery dies. And if they are small and, uh, you know, environmentally friendly, you can sweep them up and maybe they just rust and disappear, so they turn right back into, uh, you know, the iron that's mined out of the earth. Those are just a list of possible applications. I, I think you'll, you really will be able to think about changing the design space of, of products, where today, if you have a battery-powered product, product, you generally have to size it to fit the battery. The microelectronics have really been miniaturized, but the batteries haven't been um, equivalently miniaturized. So now, instead of the device overall function and shape being limited by the size of the battery, now the battery scales with the electronics. We think if you're going to build miniaturized electronic devices, the best place to put the power is to put it right on the chip.
The, the key in the cost of production is to make sure that the battery is used, is made via similar processes as the rest of the computer chip. Uh, and so that's why we picked using these photo patterning because computer chips are already photo patterned. And that's why we picked these electroplating processes because the semiconductor industry already does electroplating when it makes computer chips. Um, so I wouldn't argue that it is a low cost on its own, but it fits right into the process flow of making electronic devices. So it doesn't add much cost to the chip you're already making. If I think about the work in, in batteries and other, like why would you want to print this? First of all, there's of course the customization aspect. And when you make one cell phone for the masses, you have to limit function and exchange for mass production. Can we give ourselves this diversity of customization and retain the function? Because I don't think anyone's going to want a really kludgy cell phone which is four times bigger just so it has an extra axis of an accelerometer. But maybe they would be very interested if the cell phone was designed to be a certain shape that fit on their body or in their clothes in a certain way. And that's not what the next person has. So I, I think it's customization for function will be the where we really get legs. Customization for aesthetics is fun, but maybe not, may not give us the legs we need. To find out more about what we're doing, uh, a great place to start is, is just my department webpage. So at the University of Illinois, the Material Science Department has a webpage that lists faculty. I give a number of, of talks that are sometimes more public interest oriented, and some of these can be found on the web. Then I also have a startup company working on batteries uh, named Zerion, and they have a webpage that talks about some of that technology evolution. For detailed inquiries, you know, people, people often read out directly. What I've really enjoyed is that this field is one that of, of sort of 3D fab, nobody is an expert, that it's, it's a new area, it's a growing area. Um, you know, people have made contributions coming in from everything from really hardcore physics through the chemistry through design and, and engineering, you know, it, and I think it's really the diversity of and the open-endedness of the field that, you know, allows really the human imagination to, to sort of run wild and then reduce it to a tangible object. And that's, that's different than most areas of engineering where you go to a catalog and you can pick out this gear and this gear and that, and if they don't fit, you're out of luck. Mm -hmm. And so there's just, it, it, I think it really opens up the human imagination into you know, how we can make the things the world uses. Thank yeah. you so much. Hey, thank you. Yeah, great job.